So auto scaling pods and nodes in Kubernetes, where to start? Screen is up. All right. So who am I and why am I talking to you today? I come from the IBM Watson performance engineering team. And our job is basically we look after the IBM Watson clusters. So 22 different Kubernetes clusters across six regions. They're anywhere from 100 pods to 8,500 pods. We're looking at stability, performance, and cost savings. So are they staying up? Are they staying up when they're being hit with heavy loads? And then when they're not being hit with heavy loads, can we kind of roll them back and save on some of the money that comes from having all that hardware? Our team's been creating auto-scaling resources and guidelines for the different Watson service and infrastructure teams since Kubernetes 110. And we have run into our fair share of walls. So listening to people in the chat today, it sounds like we have some familiarity with auto-scaling and some not at all. And I'm here to show you what we have learned so that you don't have to learn it the hard way. Our agenda. So there will be four main categories. One is a fundamentals refresher course, followed by the types of Kubernetes auto-scaling. And then we'll go into a deep dive in a case study. So my hope is for those of you who walked in off the street said, I know nothing about auto-scaling, but DevOps sounds fun. These first two sections you should be able to follow. You should pick something up. Uh, for those of you who come from, I've played with auto-scalers before. We can get into this deep dive for HPA sounds cool. How do we set it up? And then for those of you who have already installed it because it sounds cool and now it's doing weird things, that's where the case study for tuning will come in. So when we hit these slide breaks, I'm going to take questions just so we don't get a backlog going. And then there should be some time at the end as well. All right, so let's jump into it. Fundamentals of Refresher course. Refresher, why do you care about auto scaling? So one of the main perks is it handles load spikes without a human having to be present. So you've left your service, you're on your lunch break, or you're sleeping in the dead of night, or it's your weekend and you'd rather not be bothered. And somebody says, you know what we should do? We should do a hackathon using your service and we'll hit it with you know, a couple thousand people more than you've ever tested it with before. Probably it'll be fine. So auto scaling kicks in. It says, OK, I need more pods. I need more nodes. I will handle this spike in traffic. And you're not going to get pinged with somebody saying, hey, go fix the thing. The other main appeal of auto scaling is you know, on the flip side of having really high loads, you could also have really low load times. And if that's the case, if, say, you work with businesses and it's 4 AM on a Saturday, you can probably scale down your hardware and save some money. Uh, the other advantages are it's automatic scaling, so you're not relying on a person. So there's nobody manually typing in commands during a crisis, trying to scale out your deployments accurately, request your hardware accurately. So you're not having that, you know, the mishaps that can happen when humans realize, oops, we've got to fix the thing. We've got to do it now under pressure. So second main concept that you should know here, performance bottlenecks. Um, several people have a vague idea. Let's just get this out in the open so everybody's on the same page. Every service has something that will prevent it from scaling to handle load. So if you keep increasing how much stuff is hitting your service, at some point you're going to go from a nice, flat, gradually increasing line to the hockey stick of doom, where your response times, they've jumped, and your error rates have increased. So. Terminology, if we say a service is CPU bound, performance is going to be limited by the CPU resources it has available. Uh, once you run out of CPU, that's it. You can have a bunch of memory, you can have a bunch of bandwidth left over, but if you run out of CPU and that's your bottleneck, your service is not going to be happy. And then refresher on Kubernetes, for those of you who said you picked this at random. Kubernetes, it's an open source system. It automates deployment, scaling, and management of containerized applications. Obviously, today we'll be talking about scaling. So if we look at our terminology, a node is a worker machine or a piece of hardware, and it contains everything necessary to run pods. A pod is going to be a collection of containers. 
A container is going to be a single microservice. So a pod is basically microservices that live well together. A deployment is going to be the thing that rolls out duplicates of your pods. It will be backed by a replica set. So if I talk about replicas, that's what I'm talking about. And then a service is kind of a human readable port that gives you a framework to access these pods. And then we get into the scary chart. So this is a refresher on requests, limits, and quality of service classes. So Kubernetes has two main resources that will actually be specified in your spec. So you'll say, I need this amount of CPU and I need this amount of memory. Uh, the main difference between CPU and memory is whether they're compressible or not. CPU is compressible, so you can grab a bunch of it. And if you find that you have to give some back, that's totally fine. You can just give it back and move on. Memory is non-compressible. So if you find that you need more memory and then somebody else needs it more than you, there's no easy way to get it back from you short of killing your pod. So that's a distinction that most people don't know, but it can get you into trouble. So for each of these resources, you give two values. You say, I want to request this much. And you can also say, I want to give a limit of this much. Requests are something you will always need. You talk to Kubernetes and say, I need this to schedule onto a node. If I can't get this, just leave me in pending in a queue somewhere because there's no point in me even being here. Limits, you have options. So you can kind of take your risk reward ratio. You can say, I want to be a guaranteed pod. I'm the highest possible priority. So set my requests and my limits equal. So I will have what I said I need to work. I will never have any more, but you will not kill me until the very, very end. So if you're feeling a little more daring, you can say, actually, I think I wanna be burstable. I'm gonna tell you, I want this level of requests and also this level of limits. My limits will be higher than my requests. And if I can cheat up and get that resource, then that's great for me. I can run faster or I can do better calculations. There's something that makes that risk worth it. But if I try and take more than the limits, you're going to stop me. Um, with CPU, if I try and take more than my limits, then you're going to throttle me and you'll actually use the Linux scheduler to make sure that I can't get more CPU. Um, if I try and use more than my limits in memory, uh, there's no great way to get it back. I've gone over my limit, I'm non-compressible, so kill my pod, take it back, and we'll start over, I guess. And then there's also best effort pods, which say, sometimes you have a bunch of resources left over on your cluster, and if you're feeling particularly daring, you can just pick up all those idle resources, try and run really fast, and just finish whatever you need to do before you get killed because somebody else needs them. All right, so that should have been some level setting. Do we have any questions from that first part? Um, Patrick Brooks um, asks in chat, what is CFA? CFA, I might need context on that. I don't remember where that came from. Uh, While well, Patrick gets that, um, Krishna Jalati, what AI capabilities are available for auto scaling? What AI capabilities are available for auto scaling? So several of the auto scalers are going to have algorithms that take into account the memory or the CPU or some kind of metric. And based on that, they're going to run a calculation of how many pods you need or how big your pods need to be. So I wouldn't exactly call it AI, but it is very data driven. And we'll get into that in the next section. And Patrick Brook replies, it's on your previous slide. CFS, uh, the completely fair scheduler. So that's a Linux process that basically checks who's running in CPU. And if it sees that somebody is cheating up on how many CPU cycles they're taking, it will prevent them until the next time slot. Cool, cool. Uh, that seems to be all questions in chat for now. All right, so we'll get into the types of autoscalers. There are three major flavors of autoscalers. As you can see, they're pineapple, strawberry, and blue raspberry. No, 
So we have the horizontal pod autoscaler, which commonly referred to as HPA. And there are two different flavors of this, I guess, two types. One is CPU based, which has been here basically since the beginning. And then one is the new hot freshness, uh, custom metrics. So scaling on something other than CPU. The next major flavor will be cluster auto scaling. So this is scaling out your actual Kubernetes cluster, your hardware. And then the third flavor is vertical pod auto scaling. Um, sometimes you'll see something called an add-on resizer. This is like a vertical pod auto scaler light, but for deployments. And that's actually used inside the Kubernetes metrics services themselves. A uh, good way to remember this is horizontal pod autoscaler. You have a bunch of little pods that lead off into the horizon. Uh, cluster autoscaler, it scales your cluster. And then vertical pod autoscaling, it's like if you took one pod and you stretched it vertically and you made it really big. So let's go into what use cases look like for these. So horizontal pod autoscaling on CPU. You've got a service, it's CPU bound, so there's your bottleneck. It's comfortably sized to handle X amount of requests. So you're gonna have X amount of CPU usage. Suddenly somebody says, we're gonna have a hackathon with your thing. And now you're getting 5X requests, so you need 5X the CPU. So you're in your before state, oh no, catastrophe. You can assume that the spike is going to pass, so it's not like you should just permanently allocate five times as much stuff. And you can assume that at some point you'll resume your typical usage levels. So <clears throat> the autoscaler looks at this and says, okay, we need five of these. It sends a note out to Kubernetes, schedules five pods, now you're good to go. So the other option here is horizontal pod autoscaling on something other than CPU. You've got a service. The bottleneck here is different. It's not CPU. It's some kind of other metric. So memory, the number of items in a queue, um, number of requests, uh, number of people talking to you. So you've got this metric. This pod could handle two documents in your queue. And let's say you're running a translation service, and somebody goes, oh no, I really need to translate this gigantic 100-page document. Let me just throw it at this service. So now all of a sudden, you have three times as many things in your queue. You've got this massive backlog. And you're realizing if you have one pod handling it, it's going to take you forever. So Autoscaler looks at this, says, there's a bunch of stuff in your queue. I think you need more pods. Scales up more pods. So we move on to cluster autoscaling, this one talking about hardware. So one of the previous autoscalers has scaled up a whole bunch of pods. And then Kubernetes says, hey, wait a sec. Looking at these requests, these don't actually fit on my hardware. So there's more CPUs or memories requested than I have. So some pod here is just going to be stuck in a pending state. We're still assuming that it's either the hackathon or the person translating their 100-page paper and then at some point, this is going to end. So it doesn't make sense to permanently put more hardware just because you've seen this once. So Cluster Autoscaler looks at this. It says, I see pending pods. I know what I need to do here is I grab another node that looks like my first node. And we'll grab that. And then we'll plunk this new pod onto it. Everybody's good to go. So here we go. And then the final part that we'll be going over today, vertical pod autoscaling. This is for the people who have a service and then get, I know I need to size this and I'm just going to pick some size and I'm going to throw it in production and probably it'll be fine. So if you think about this thought pattern, normally it means you really oversize your pod just so nothing terrible happens to it in production. So you used your best guess and you picked something. And it would be lovely if somebody would go behind you and look at the actual usage and figure out how to resize your container. And it'd be even more lovely if somebody would just take care of that for the rest of the pod's known life. Have an autoscaler that just permanently right sizes things for you. So that's more of the vertical pod autoscaling use case. I mentioned the add-on resizer, which is like vertical autoscaling for deployments. Uh, the way that this gets used is in Kubernetes, it'll look at the actual size of your cluster, and the metric server and the metric server nanny will talk, 
and I'll say, based on how many things are in your cluster, this is how big you need to be to handle all of the metrics that are going to be coming at you. And all of these are great. Are they all at the same level of maturity? No, no, they are not. So the most mature one of these autoscalers is CPU-based HPA. It's been built into the guts of Kubernetes. It's been there since 1.3. The algorithms are continuing to improve, taking away things like long cooldown timers or points where it just oscillated right over a threshold. So that's at the point where we've got about 30% of our production deployments going ahead and using it. We trust it. We know it's been around. It's stable enough to actually use in critical applications. So you look at custom metrics HPA, it's V2 beta 2 code, so it's coming. It's more stable than it has been, but it's still not GA yet. And the tricky part about this one is depending on your metrics engine, you're going to need some kind of third-party adapter code. This adapter code will not be maintained by Kubernetes, so you're relying on Prometheus, Datadog, Sysdig, Google Stack Driver, Whoever you use for metrics has to actually go ahead and maintain that adapter code and assumedly maintain it moving forward as they move from the V2 format to the GA format. So depending on who you're using, you want to keep an eye on that before you trust it. Uh, right now we use this in our dev and staging environments and we're still monitoring because we don't fully trust that adapter code in production yet. Cluster auto scaling, it's been around since Cube 1.8. Uh, most cloud providers generally have GA support. Everybody's kind of done their little flavor on it. So it will work differently moving from cloud to cloud. So read the fine print. And then vertical pod auto scaling, it's currently in beta. Uh, several cloud providers are talking about this as a tech preview. So it's interesting. I don't necessarily trust it in production yet, but I'll be curious to see where it goes. All right, uh, stopping for questions again. Apologize, my display is being buggy. It turned itself off. Um, so Krishna Gelati um, asked, are you able to share this presentation? Uh, I believe that all of these presentations will be shared of both the presentations and the slides. At least that's my understanding. OK. Um, and then uh, Vikrant Verma um, asks, how is Kubernetes autoscaler related to its load balancer? Is it possible that it's still sending requests to a few pods only instead of evenly distributing after it got scaled up? Yes, that is possible. Um, they do not necessarily work together. Uh, if you have something like pod affinity or anti-affinity or something with nodes where it's directing traffic, yes, that can still cause issues even if you have an autoscaler active. Um, that's actually one of the things I'll say to look for because we've seen deployments where that's had problems in the past. Okay. And Hannah Lehman asks, are each of these types of autoscalers just as easy to implement? I'm going to go with no, mainly because whenever you have the third party adapter code, at that point, you're having to do additional hookups. Uh, HPA on CPU, which is what we're about to go into, is super easy to set up. It's a single Kubernetes object. Once you start getting into cluster auto scaling, you have a bunch of config maps. You need to toggle some switches, install some packages. It's all well documented. It's just not as straightforward. And then with the third party adapter code, your mileage may vary depending on who you're working with. All right. Um, Hannah says, cool, thank you. All right. And that's it for questions for now. So apologies to everybody who wandered in off the street. This is when we start going into the weeds. Uh, you're welcome to stick around and try and keep up. All right, so we're gonna go into a deep dive on creating a CPU-based HPA object. I will not show actual code, but I will give you concepts that are very useful to have when you're trying to do one of these and size it correctly. All right, so there are two major disclaimers that I feel the need to mention before you start preparing to make one of these. The first one is 
several people have moved from a VM environment where you had this gigantic, you know, four CPU, eight CPU, 12 CPU machine, and you've been asked to squish it into a containerized environment. And some people just grab that VM, they package it up in a very tight jacket, and they shove it into Kubernetes. So you now have a 12 CPU pod that takes five to 10 minutes to boot. That's not going to work well with auto scaling. You want to try and make your pods as small and quick to boot as possible, because if you're auto scaling, that means you have an issue with load that needs to be addressed. You would like to get a pod that can address the load in something fairly fast. So if you have microservices, a way that you can compensate for them is you can set the CPU th threshold lower and allow more time to scale and hopefully they can make it. But long-term, you really wanna re-architect to have the microservices that Kubernetes was meant to run with. Um, the other major disclaimer is another anti-pattern I've seen is people have clusters and they go, you know, I'm not sure how much space I need, so I'm just going to get a lot of space. I'm going to use a lot of burstable pods, and we'll just use a bunch of limits because we have all this space. Once you move to a point where you have cluster auto scaling and you're doing just in time hardware, all of a sudden, all of that extra space you were using for limits is no longer available. At this point, it's good to go through, check all your pods, and make sure that they can actually run at their request values. Okay, so the question about how do I make a HPA object? Um, the actual code you can find online, but it's basically cube control create HPA, give it information, and then an object like this is going to pop out. So you've got the name of the HPA object, you've got the deployment that it's referencing to scale up and scale down, you've got the age it was created, and then you've got these interesting fields here. So the first thing is, how many replicas can you have? What's the minimum number of things you can have? What's the maximum? So these are numbers you'd specify. And then the other important number here is what is your target scaling threshold? So this will be a percentage value. It will be a percentage of your request. So most clusters have something called a request to limit ratio. And this basically says, you know, if I can have this amount of requests, I can have five times that many limits. So if that's the case, then theoretically, you can make this value from 1% to 500%, and that would be fine. Anything more than 500 would become meaningless because it's outside of that request ratio. And when you want to calculate CPU utilization, it's actually multiplying these two values together, the first of the target values and the replicas. So say that we went from this and we had a load spike. So we realized we had 60% utilization. 60% is higher than our scaling threshold. So at this point, it tries to split it across different pods. So we go from 60 over 50 and one replica to 30 over 50 and two replicas. Because it's multiplying the numbers, it's still the same amount of utilization, it's just distributed better. So calculating utilization with multiple containers. This one comes up a lot because it's not intuitive. So if you have an unbalanced pod, and that's where you've set some kind of load against it, and there are multiple containers in there, and they all have different levels of CPU utilization, you can wind up in a funny spot where you don't entirely know what the utilization is. So you may have an intuitive idea, okay, we've got 250s and a 100, so that's probably 66%. No. The way that the formula works is it actually goes over the CPU used and the CPU requested, and it sums them across all the containers. So it's not necessarily intuitive, and it can get you into problems if there's a case where you've got one container that is completely maxed out, it's hit its bottleneck, it's throwing errors, but there are larger containers on the pod that look fine. The autoscaler just looks at this one overall number and says, oh, you're good. There's no need to worry about it. So be aware of that. That's gotten us into trouble before. So for sizing guidance, uh, we found that the different quality of service classes, you need to handle them slightly different. Uh, the most common type of pod that we have is burstable. So it has a request, it has a higher limit. 
So we found that for these pods, size them somewhere between 70 and 100% utilization. Some of our pods, they do nothing, and then they get a massive spike of traffic. So we go ahead and we say, OK, when you see something closer to 100%, that's fine. Because honestly, it's going to hit all of those marks pretty quickly. Um, when we have those macro services, like we talked about, the VM kind of in a very tight jacket, uh, we go ahead and size those on the lower end. We'll say, OK, size at 70%, and hopefully that rest of that request and your limit will help you survive long enough to reach a ready state. Uh, we actually said, if you can't do this, sizing on a threshold of 70% or higher, you really just should not be auto scaling. We found that it's just not cost effective. So there are different rules for a guaranteed quality of service class because these are the ones where request and limits are equal. So when you start running into a problem with how much you have left of your requests, you have no limits to save you afterward. So for these, we've said size lower than an 80% utilization, because if you're cheating up into the 90% range, you're just going to get yourself in trouble. Uh, we actually found there's a counterintuitive strategy for these where you could set a really low threshold and a low number of max replicas and have it scale out from its min, hit its max, and then it will operate inside its CPU requests afterward. And that way you get an immediate response when you need the pods, and then they can also kind of gradually fill up. Uh, one thing to caution you about, thresholds above 100% are risky. Uh, requests are the only thing that you are ever guaranteed on a Kubernetes cluster. Limits are lovely when they exist, but you will only ever have requests. So it's a bad idea to rely on limits being available to you, especially if you're going to gate your auto scaling behind having a limit. Because you can hit a point where you're in uh, resource stress in your cluster, and you can never get above 100% to point out, hey, I should have some more pods. So we've seen people get into bad states because of that. So if you're sizing your max and your min replicas, uh, first thing to know, set your threshold first. Depending on your threshold, the max replica value is going to ping pong back and forth. So the way that we like to size these whenever we have the opportunity is we look at the current CPU behavior. What kind of usage have you had for the last 90 days? So this slightly hard to read yellow chart is a graph of the CPU utilization that a particular service has seen. So you can see steady state, and then they get a massive spike of traffic, and it goes right back down again. So I've drawn the lines that we've taken to say, OK, this is our median CPU usage. So at least half the time, we're going to be below that. And as you can see, this is actually a very conservative line there. And then I've also drawn a line for this is above the maximum CPU usage we've ever seen. And you'll have to do a little bit of math here, but you want to sum the CPU requests of the minimum number of pods you have. Make sure that's above your median CPU usage. Uh, if you're not above your median, you can wind up kind of toggling back and forth extremely quickly. And that can actually cause some of the other Kubernetes pods to get stressed because they keep having to process the events of you scaling up and scaling down around one particular value. Uh, for your max replicas, a uh, piece of advice, set your max higher than your min. Uh, you wouldn't think you have to say it out loud, but we have seen multiple occasions where the min and max were equal. The autoscaler said, I should scale, and then it realized that it couldn't because it was already at its maximum. So check that if you're having issues. Um, similar calculation to the min. Make sure that your summed CPU requests are higher than whatever CPU usage you've seen in this observation period. And then one other value to be aware of, some namespaces come with a CPU quota. This is a Kubernetes concept that basically says, I'm putting you in namespaces so that you never have to talk. You're not going to intersect. But I realize some namespaces can run away with all the resources in a cluster if I don't cap them somehow. So a quota says, in your namespace, you can only use this much CPU. Uh, if your quota has limited your CPU and your autoscaler wants to create more pods that would go over that, the quota will win. So you need to be aware of that value and if it's going to keep you from scaling when you think you could.
So a basic process to create, modify, and verify in staging, or whatever non-production environment you like. Uh, first off, create an object. Uh, low threshold, low min, high max. Stick it in your environment. Make sure it turns on. So drive some kind of load against it. It doesn't have to be much. What you're mainly looking for here is, do you see a utilization percentage? If it shows unknown, that means something's hooked up incorrectly and you need to go back and fix it. Um, if you see your percent utilization go over your threshold, you should see new replicas scale up. So do this and kind of sanity check, make sure that your objects are set up correctly. Then after that, you can modify to your preferred threshold and your scaled down min and max value, and then you can drive more load. So you'd expect that it would continue scaling up replicas as expected. Uh, one way to make sure that you're doing what you think you're doing is go through and check your CPU metrics. You can use cube control top to do it entirely in the system, or you can use your third party metrics tool. And you want to look at, you know, does this match with having a CPU bottleneck? And does this match with having scaling on the CPU utilization threshold? After that, you want to review your load driver logs. You may have scaled up, but if you don't get there in the right amount of time, you're still going to see those error rates. You're still going to see the long running requests. So just make sure that, yes, you're scaling, but you're also doing what you need for your service. And then test, modify, verify, and keep going till you like your results. After that, you deploy into production and you sail on into the sunset. This is the part where several of my service teams got really nervous because they didn't trust HPA objects enough yet. If you're worried about having one of these objects running in your production environment and you really just want a sanity check, one easy way to do a sanity check is make an object, set your minimum to whatever the current number of things you have in production is. That way you cannot make it any worse. Even if HPA just falls dead on the floor, you still have the same number of replicas. And then you set your max replicas to some count higher than that. And now if you do have that surprise load surge, it can handle it. And then the other important thing about deploying to production, your workloads will change over time. The thing you size today may not work next year. It's always good to monitor and iterate if you see large changes in behaviors. So it's helpful to have alerts that say, I have scaled up to my maximum number of replicas. So if you see that alert, if you see it more than once, you go, OK, something is wrong here. We should check and make sure that we are actually handling everything and we don't, in fact, need more replicas. Um, you can also add an alert for, I've literally never scaled above my min. Do I need this much hardware? OK, break for questions again. Um, all right, so we have a question from Krishna Jalati. Uh, could you share some information about auto scale down? So scale down. So coming particularly from an HPA CPU perspective, um, we've talked about scaling up. It's based on that utilization threshold. Um, by the same token, it will look at that utilization threshold and if it sees that it's dropped to a point where it could do that math in reverse and it could say, yes, we can fit less pods. If you stay in a point where the math works for, I believe that it was two minutes in the last release I looked at, there'll be a certain amount of scale down time. I believe it's configurable. If you stay there long enough, Kubernetes will say, okay, the math works. I can start scaling down now. So it actually runs the same calculation. It, it runs a calculation and it spits out, this is the number of replicas I need right now. And if that is different from the actual amount of replicas you have for long enough, that's what actually triggers that scale down. Hopefully that's helpful. Cool. Um, doesn't look like we have any other questions for now. Oh, actually, we got another one. Uh, Patrick Brooks, trigger alarm when max replicas are reached and trigger alarm if never scaled down above min replicas. Have you ever seen these alarms created via Prometheus or Alert Manager? 
I haven't seen it in Prometheus. Um, I have seen teams use it in Sysdig. I believe Prometheus should work the same way. It's the most third-party metrics providers have some level of alerting for you've hit this. I would assume that would be a standard feature. So I can't tell you exactly how to do it, but I would expect that to be an option that you can do. All right, Patrick Brooks says, cool, thanks. And All right. that looks about <laughs> everything we got for now. And we got about 10 minutes left. I know it's a little bit early to call that out, but letting you know. Okay, that's super helpful, thank you. All right, so case study. I know we had a request for how do I tune my HBAs for real service if they're acting kind of funky in production? So I'm gonna go through the methodology that our team uses and also walk you through uh, a service that was having problems and what we did to get them back on track. So when people come to us and say, our HPA is broken, we don't know why. Uh, I make them run through a prereqs checklist just to rule out a lot of the funny situations that we've found along the way. So first off is, have you run for long enough to gather data? Again, I really like that three-month look back when we can get it. Uh, next is, have you seen evidence of load spikes higher than your day-to-day -day utilization? If there's no load spikes, auto-scaling might not be your right choice. It may just be you don't have enough machines to begin with. We need to check that the bottleneck is CPU if you're using a CPU-based HPA, because if it's a different metric, it's not going to scale the way you think. So here's where we get into a question we had earlier. You need to make sure that the CPU utilization is spread evenly or near evenly across all the pods, because you can get into a point where you're scaling things up but only directing traffic to one place. You need to check that your load spike duration is longer than your startup time for a new pod. If your pod takes 10 minutes to start up and the spike is already done by then, it's not really helpful to start a new pod. You should check that all your containers have explicit CPU requests and limits defined. Why is this? Because if they're not defined, Kubernetes uses the default values and they are tiny, tiny values. We're talking a quarter of a CPU here. You should check that your containers are normalized. So this is what we talked about with balanced or unbalanced. If you've got multiple containers, they should all reach the same percentage of their CPU request at the same time. And also CPU should be the bottleneck for all of them. You shouldn't hit some other problem first. It's also helpful if the team knows their typical production workload and if they have some kind of automation that they can use to drive workload and test it you know, before they go live and it blows up. So let's talk about Foo Service. Uh, Foo Service, they are one of our services. They were running in production. And we kept getting incidents from the SRE team going, you know, it's odd, but occasionally we'll see the service. They get a big spike of traffic, and then it works great for part of the time. And then we also have random bursts of 500 errors, and they slow way down, and we're not sure why. So we looked at this, they meet most of the prereqs, um, everything else we could kind of smush in so it worked. Their CPU bound, their usage was across all the pods evenly. The spikes were an hour plus and their pods started faster than that, thankfully. They've got explicit requests, they've got explicit limits, there's one container per pod so there's no normalizing weirdness and they had automation. So we said, great, we can take them on. So first step is gather and visualize your data. Autoscalers are interesting to try and visualize because it's changing constantly based on what happened in the timestamps before whatever time you are now. So you can either try and figure this out by running the exact right amount of load, or you can try and figure it out beforehand. But whenever you change one of the variables, your min, your max, your utilization, you're going to see the entire calculation change. So first time we tried to write it out by hand, we said, okay, minute zero, minute one, minute two, what kind of usage do we see? What's the utilization that we see? How many pods do we need? When do they actually start up? And we realized this is a nightmare to write out. It took us about half an hour and then we said, you know what we need to do? We need to change the utilization threshold. 
That changes literally every value on this chart. Cool. So we went ahead and we actually wrote a Python notebook, created an emulator that mocks what will happen. Um, if you're going to do this kind of calculation mocking, I would highly recommend look at the number of pods that you need per timestamp and look at the utilization separately because sometimes you have issues with the number of pods in play and sometimes you have issues with the amount of utilization that you think you can get, but you actually can't. Uh, Katie, so, you have about five minutes left. Sorry for interrupting. All righty. So data gathering, we looked at our foo service. We reached into cube control to get these values. So you've got your CPU values. You've got your HPA values. And we also wrote another Jupyter notebook to go through and look at how long does our pod take to boot to get scheduled, initialized, and ready. So based on that, we pulled these out. Um, we looked at the scaling situation. So we went into our metrics provider, looked at we've got seven CPUs to start, 94 to finish. How long was that scale up? How long did we hold it there? What did scale down look like? Does it look like that was the problem? And we plugged everything in. So when we plugged it in, we found that from a pod replica standpoint, we're totally fine. We go from the minimum to something below the maximum, should be totally fine. So the team looked at this and they said, oh, HPA is not having any problems. Now the issue is on the other side in utilization. So I've mentioned this several times before, anything over 100 is not guaranteed. So what we had was they were running for 70 minutes in the danger zone of relying on limits to be there. And periodically in those 70 minutes, limits were not available. So they actually started dropping requests. So to get this team back to a good spot, we said, change your threshold to something that's 100% or less so that you're running in requests, which you could do that. You could say, yay, we're done, except that's not true. When you change your threshold, you change your max. So moving from 200 to 100, they would then have to change from the 12 pods they need to needing 24 pods, which is above their HPA max. So something else starts bottlenecking them. So for this, we said change to 100% or less and 24 or higher, depending on what the math would actually say. And then for the sake of completion on tuning, we looked at it and said, okay, in your normal load, you need two replicas. Now, if we tried to scale you from those two to your max of 24 during a load spike, we hit issues because not only do you need limits, you actually need more than what's available in limits because your pods take so long to start. So in the end, we wound up going, okay, keep your minimum of 10 pods and use that, scale that up to 24, and then you'll go into limits a little bit. The team deemed this an acceptable risk. And then, you know, in the future, if you find that you can take on a little more risk to save a little more money. You could actually scale your min back a little bit. So recommendations for this team, required CPU belongs in your request, target utilization below 100% because otherwise you get incidents when you're resource constrained. Uh, once you figure out utilization, raise your max accordingly, and then consider setting min a little bit lower to reduce cost but still handle load spikes. So to recap, we went through fundamentals, we went through types of auto scaling, had a deep dive and a case study. Uh, any final questions? I was on mute, I'm so sorry. Um, okay. Hannah Lehman asks, is your code for the HPA emulator shared anywhere? It is not. It's also somewhat outdated because it was built for 116 and the algorithms have changed again. Um, it's something that I would be interested in open sourcing. I have not done that yet. Um, we have quite a few thank yous over here going on. Uh, Krishna Gelati says, thank you, Katie. Excellent presentation. Learned a lot out of it. Uh, Patrick Brooks says, spectacular presentation. My coworkers need to see this today. And Hannah Lehman says, great presentation. Thank you. 
Vikrant Furman says, well explained presentation. Thank you, Katie. All right, well, thank you everybody. I hope this helps you on your road to auto scaling. And when you do get the presentation slides, I've included resources for the special interest group in auto scaling, design proposals, the different source code locations, documentation highlights, and also a disclaimer, if you use a third party metrics provider or cloud provider, you're gonna wanna check their docs because they may differ. And that's it for me.